Let's go on to policies. Uh, policies are things like COE, um, road tax, additional fuel component, and EV rebates. Uh, it's clear that the NEA wants us to push towards the Singapore Green Plan 2030. It's a sustainable future that we all have to play a part for. However, LTA is doing things that are a bit contradicting each other, right? So they, they are dangling both carrot and stick. So let's explore some of these things that uh, is being done by LTA right now. So let's talk about COE. Um, I held on, I delayed the publishing of this video for a bit because I felt that during a budget speech, something would be done for uh, EVs. So in fact, they did. So the new, the new um, what has been implemented is uh, any, any EVs that are 110 kilowatt or less will fall under Cat A and everything else Cat B. Now in the past, all EVs fell under Cat B, even entry vehicles. So new measures allow more EVs to fall under Cat A. That's, uh, that's a good move. Now the problem is glaring, right? It's, it's an affordability problem. Mass market EVs are simply not affordable in Singapore. Now the Nissan Leaf is $180,000. That was pre-Cat A COE. Now if you move back to Cat A COE, at best the vehicle is going to be $150,000 to $160,000. Not affordable. The MG ZS, $183,000. And this vehicle, 115 kilowatts, is going under Cat B. Now, Respectively, these vehicles cost $40,000 and $52,000 in the UK. These are entry-level vehicles being charged at premium prices in Singapore. So then how should we fix COE or how can we make COE better? I think LTA needs to rethink uh, COE classification. The current method of using power rating is dated, right? Um, a more powerful car is not, more, it's not less efficient than one that is not powerful, right? You can argue that in the past, uh, we were using power ratings to tax luxury. Uh, I, I do think that, however, luxury tax should be taxed on path values instead of COE. Now, uh, we should also consider efficiency rating. We should adopt a standard, for example, either use WLTP or EPA ratings. Uh, now, vehicles that are more efficient, they can fall under one category of COE, uh, and vehicles that are less efficient, they can fall under another category of COE. Now, should we not rethink COE, then the next best option is to broaden the band, broaden the power rating band for EVs. Um, 110 kilowatt for an EV is not much, right? If you, if you look at the MGs that has a bigger vehicle, it simply requires a little bit more power. Um, however, they are always still cleaner than their ICE counterpart. So I do think LTA can give uh, the power rating, uh, the bands a little more range, right? So maybe increase it to 150 kilowatt. At the end of the day, like the Singapore Green Plan said, the goal is to replace ICE vehicles with EVs. Now we come to the next topic. Uh, we, we're going to talk about road tax, additional fuel component, AFC, and EV rebates. Now before I introduce to you uh, the road tax, AFC, and EV rebates, uh, let me first apologize if I do get emotional with this section of the conversation. The reason why I do get quite emotional with this is because I think whatever that is being done by LTA does not make any sense, right? It makes sense from a budget perspective, but if you're going for a green plan, if you're trying to achieve EV as a better alternative to ICE vehicles, then whatever that is being done here does not make any sense. Now, let's move on. So AFC, if for those of you who do not know, it's an additional fuel component. It's a tax of which EV owners have to pay um, because we are not pumping petrol. So when you do not pump petrol, the government does not receive fuel excise tax. And as such, the AFC exists. In 2023, AFC will be $700 per year. So now let's look at this. A Nissan Leaf, all right? The road tax of a Nissan Leaf is $1,200 before AFC, right? At that at AFC in, that's $1,900. Now let's not look at AFC. Let's look at what the Nissan Leafs road tax is comparable to an ICE vehicle. It's comparable, comparable to a Golf GTI. In fact, the Golf GTI's road tax is cheaper than the Nissan Leaf. A Golf GTI is cheaper than a Nissan Leaf. All right? Now, let's look at the MGZS. All right, the MGZS, the road tax of a MG is $1,300. Now, if you add the AFC to that, that's about $2,000 per year. Guess what? Guess what ICE vehicle this come close to? The BMW M3, 
right, the M3 BMW that does 10 kilometers to the liter pays $2,400 in road tax a year. Now we move on to higher end vehicles. And this, I think, this is the area where things become absurd. The Polestar 2, all right, road tax before AFC, $3,900. Guess the comparable equivalent. Ferrari F8, all right, the Ferrari F8 is $3,800 in annual road tax, similar to the Polestar 2. Now we move on to the Tesla performance. Things get crazy down here. The Tesla 3 performance, all right, is $5,100 in road tax. Guess who beats the Tesla 3 performance? The Lamborghini Aventador. All right, that, that, that the road tax of the Lamborghini is $8,000. That vehicle drinks petrol like a buffet. Okay, it's free flow patrol. And that vehicle is just getting taxed about 20% more than a Tesla 3 performance. Now let's come to the solution, right? Um, obviously, let's remove AFC. Let's relook at road tax. Now for road tax, it should be on efficiency, not on power rating. Uh, this is very important because uh, the more powerful the vehicle is, doesn't mean that the vehicle is less efficient. This is quite obvious. You do not use, you do not leave behind more carbon footprint just because uh, you're driving a more powerful vehicle. Now tax the vehicle based on exactly what it leaves behind um, on the environment. Uh, so and another thing is uh, to offset the loss of vehicle taxes, let's implement carbon taxes. Now uh, the government is exploring this and it is going into our utility bills. And I think carbon tax is a great way to tax consumption. Now if ERP2 ushers in consumption-based road usage, then uh, clearly then I think Perhaps that's why LTA is sitting on this and not making much of a change. Uh, perhaps they're waiting, waiting for ERP2 so that they could bill people based on um, a consumption basis. And if they really are going to look at this, then please consider this. Carbon footprint, not power rating. All right. Look at how much carbon footprint a vehicle leaves behind by traveling every kilometer. I think that is only fair. Now let's move on to rebates and grants. Uh, this one is quite a topic, it's quite a big one, and uh, I think you have to look, there, there are some visualization as I do have some numbers uh, to work with. Uh, so fact is right now, um, there is EAI and the VES um, rebate that's given, a total of $45,000 rebate on your path or R value when you buy your vehicle. Now let, let's look at some vehicles uh, that are in the market right now that are receiving these grants. Now, a Nissan Leaf, for example, uh, with a sale price of $179,000, this vehicle is actually after a grant of, 40, of a rebate of $45,000, you know? So then the MG ZS, um, it currently costs about $182,000. Now, this is after a rebate of $42,200. Uh, the reason why I have a question mark on this is because uh, it doesn't make sense that the, the after the rebate is more than the, the, the AIF value. For those of you who, who understand the way we calculate prices, uh, you will understand why uh, there's a question mark there. Uh, same for a POSA too, right? Um, right now the vehicle costs $253,000 in Singapore and that is after rebate of $45,000. Long story short, uh, EVs are getting a lot of rebates. Uh, comparatively uh, to a Corolla Altis Hybrid, uh, if you look at it, uh, it gets only negative $15,000 in rebates. Uh, you bring back the Corolla Altis, a normal ICE vehicle, then that vehicle is getting no rebate at all. So the Corolla Altis Hybrid is going for $167,400, while the Corolla Altis is going for $131,000. Now, the cheapest vehicle in this group is the Corolla Altis, an ICE vehicle. And then the Corolla Altis Hybrid, which is $36,000 more than the regular ICE vehicle. So all these numbers are taken from um, SG Karma, right, as of February. So I did not really update the numbers um, to change it because too much work. And sadly, I didn't do it in Excel. So all these were manual calculations. I did not uh, put in any formulas. Let's move on to the problem, right? Um, so the problem here is obviously the grants, a lot of these grants are not reaching consumers. Right, EAI, uh, VES grants, they high chance are not being passed on to consumers and are subsidizing other less profitable EVs. 
um, in a very warped way, you can almost argue that EV owners are paying and funding for these grants and also they are funding other ICE vehicles. Uh, the numbers simply do not lie. Now, if you look at the Honda CRV ICE vehicle, now the reason why I'm taking this vehicle as an example is because this is a situation of a perfect um, market supply, supply and demand issue, right? Um, if you look at this, the cost of the, the CRV to purchase a CRV right now is $171,000. The basic cost for the dealership is $169,000. So they're only making about $2,000 per vehicle. That is really not much, right? And the reason for this is the people in the market who will buy a CRV will not pay any more to buy a CRV. Hence, the dealership has no there's no way they can charge more for this vehicle because people are simply priced out of the market right now. However, what happens when you have rebates that are given? So if you look at the MGZS, right, they have an OMV of $33,000. That is very similar to the CRV um, ICE vehicle. Now you would think that just because the OMV is similar and there's a rebate of almost $40,000, does it mean that the MG is $40,000 cheaper? No, it isn't. In fact, the MG is more expensive. Now, the basic cost of the MG is 136171 Now, the dealership is getting a good $45,000 margin on this vehicle. And where do you think this $45,000 came from? It's mostly from the rebates, right? So, MG can definitely afford to sell this vehicle cheaper. If they can sell it at $140, they can sell it at $150. However, because of the rebates, they can then sell it at $180,000 because the dealership believes that people will pay this amount for an EV. Hence, indirectly, the additional margins that the dealership receives from this MG covers up for other areas, for other vehicles that are less profitable. Now, this is fair, right? Um, every dealership has to earn money. If not, the business will not exist. Um, what we have to understand is what's the intent of the grant? Was it meant to be passed on to consumers or is it meant to be something to entice dealerships to bring in EVs? Because if EVs are not profitable, naturally dealerships will not bring in EVs. However, with the rebate, dealerships can earn way more money if they bring in EVs. Now then they build the supply. So grants indirectly help build supply for EVs. However, when or if you buy a vehicle that is direct to the brand, for example, if there is no dealership involved, like a Tesla, then consumers tend to benefit way more from these grants. And that's because the, the price of the vehicle, the selling price, the OMV of a Tesla 3 performance, for example, is $72,000. Inside this $72,000, Tesla has already made the money it wants. There is no additional layer that they have to cover. So then they can pass on these rebates to the consumer. So then what is the solution to grants? I think this one is complicated, right? It, it is not an easy solution. So what we are doing right now is neither right nor wrong. And I think it's one of the uh, most acceptable solutions that we have. So the reason for this is Singapore is in the, for EV, for EV market, right? We have a low supply, low demand market right now. Right, where there is really not many EV models that are in Singapore. And number two, um, the demand is also quite low. So by putting in these rebates, what the government is trying to achieve is uh, two things. Right? You're trying to increase demand and then at the same time, you're also trying to increase supply. Why I say increasing supply is because EVs then become more profitable. So if you look at some of the dealerships, the numbers that we ran through earlier, it's very obvious that EVs are becoming um, very profitable because of these grants. Um, most of the time, the dealerships are taking almost 80-90% of the grants. So herein lies the catch-22, right? Because of these grants, which was meant to increase demand, has unintended consequences where it has increased supply. Uh, and this has resulted in EVs subsidizing ICE vehicles. So for every profitable EV, um, it can subsidize a few more ICE vehicles. So it has indirectly made ICE vehicles cheaper. So you are extending the, uh, you're extending the lifespan of an ICE vehicle right now. This is, I, I think it's an unintended um, outcome uh, of, of rebates, right? Uh, so what we can do, right? I think we should really look 
and think at what can we do to increase, to significantly increase demand for EVs. Um, whatever that we put in place should try to reduce the ownership cost and the running cost of EVs such that um, in the next five years, we speed up the trajectory of EV adoption in Singapore. Things like relooking at road tax, things like removing AFC, um, things that perhaps even giving tax rebates on EVs. So we should, inc we should really look at whatever, um, whatever solution that we're trying to implement. Is it increasing demand or is it increasing supply? I think this is something that we need to look at. And of course, if you're watching this video, uh, if you have good solutions that you have in mind, please do share in the comments below because this is one topic where we all have a stake in, right? Uh, it's not easy. Um, it's not easy planning for policies and things like this. So I really encourage anyone, if you have good ideas, please share it in the comments below so that we can, we can all increase EV adoption together. Um, at the end of the day, what we want to do is to replace ICE vehicles um, so that we have a more uh, a better future. So uh, we have come to the conclusion of um, our chat on EV adoption and Singapore Green Plan 2030. Uh, if, you, if you like the content being put up in this video, please please do like and subscribe to the channel. And of course, of course, if you have good solutions or suggestions of ideas, please leave it in the comments below. Please think through it and, and have a good conversation and dialogue going with each other, right? Uh, I think this is one of the better ways to, instead of complaining, let's look at how we can all chip in and provide a solution um, together, right? So I think that's a better future for everyone. So um, again, thank you for listening to this. It's quite a long one. So hope you guys have a great week ahead.